So um, I think I want to get into the various arguments for theism and you know to just discuss those with you. But before that, um, so um, I know your case for naturalism. I mean, basically, I think you laid it out pretty much in a brief manner, right? So the idea is um, naturalism um, has a greater explanatory power and is simpler than theism, right? So even it can be, there's a weaker version of the argument. Uh, it's simpler and it's got at least as good explanatory power. That would be enough. Uh -huh. yeah. right? So it's not that it has to explain more. It just has to explain everything at least as well, uh -huh. which, which yeah. is what I argued in the best argument against God, for example. Yeah, you, you, you're willing to give up on the explanatory part, but not on the simplicity part. Yeah. Uh, so, because the argument, I, because I think that the simplicity part is kind of straightforward, there are lots of theists who just concede straight off that even though it's kind of hard to assess, you know, exactly simplicity, it's just sort of obvious that um, naturalism is simpler because naturalism just has the natural universe and theism has the natural universe and then it has a god who makes the natural universe and then it has these other entities like demons and angels and so on right um it just feels kind of obvious that naturalism is a simpler view and so you get people like um paul moser who just says i don't know why we're arguing about this we should theists should just concede that point the, the simplicity point and i argue that there's all this stuff that um, naturalists can't explain um, yeah and and so a lot of the discussion um, both that I give and that other people give is on is looking at the explanations and thinking about okay so what sorts of things are there where what are the cases where theism might have a better explanation than naturalism so um, what do you think about Josh Rasmussen you know, approach towards like simplicity, you know, his idea, yeah. So Josh thinks that, that there's a kind of important notion of simplicity that has to do with what's at what he calls the fundamental level. So he thinks that at the fundamental level, theism is simpler than naturalism. And I'm not inclined to believe that. I mean, it depends a little bit what we think is at the fundamental level but i'm just going to take it that what's at the fundamental level is what's described by your axioms right they're, they're theoretically fundamental you can't reduce them further and so for example at the fundamental level any um indeterministic um causation is fundamental uh, and if Josh thinks, for example, that God makes lots of indeterministic decisions, then that's a whole lot of complexity in his theory that's just not there in the naturalistic theory. And when you're saying, you know, what's when you're comparing things at the fundamental level, you just have to make sure that you don't leave out anything that really is fundamental according to your theory. Yeah, so just for the clarity of the audience, you know, basically, you know, as far as I understand, his idea, Josh Rasmussen's idea is that, so let's just say this is the initial stage of the natural reality, then, um, you know, yeah, these has some arbitrary limits, right? It has a shape and, you know, mass and blah, blah, blah. So these are some arbitrary limits. And then you have this limitless entity called God, right? So in the fundamental level, for theism, you have God, and that's much more simpler than, you know, naturalism because God doesn't have any limits, right? So my question, you know, just to follow up on this is, um, the I think he agrees that natural real the initial state of the natural reality has some limits, right? And God would have to explain these limits, and when it comes to that, you know, he has to think he he has to concede that God makes them brute choices about the mass and you know shape and blah 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 of yeah. the initial natural state right so that's as simple as, i mean as complicated as the naturalist model right yeah so that's certainly what i would say yeah. um you've got you've got a certain number of things to characterize the initial state of the universe and 
if what happens is we go, well, for each of those, there's this corresponding thing in God that explains the, oh. <laughs> that particular value. Yeah. And then there's this other stuff, right? God's perfect. That doesn't figure anywhere in the the naturalist story. It just yeah, looks I mean, like this story is going to be more complicated. Yeah, I mean, the best that these can do is, you know, argue that, you know, God is limitless. And then, you know, there's the initial state of the natural, you know, uh, reality that God created and then some initial loss. And then the story goes on. But then you have these, you know, arbitrary limits of the natural, uh, the, the initial state of the natural state and blah, 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 the loss and stuff like that to explain. And then you have like yeah. goodness in God. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So coming back to um, the arguments for theism, right? Um, so I think right now, I think your case is pretty much clear. So I want to get into the arguments for theism. Um, I'm going to go with the Kalam cosmological argument, the age old Kalam argument. Uh, so basically, whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore, uh, God exists. I mean, therefore, oh, the therefore universe, the universe. <laughs> the universe has a cause. There's yeah. a big gap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was an invalid argument, but yeah, I mean, therefore, the universe has a cause. <laughs> okay, so there's a question about what natural reality looks like that we need to um, take up to begin with. So it might be that there's just our universe and it has an absolute beginning um, back at what we'll call time T0. Or it might be that there's a multiverse. And if there's a multiverse in which um, there are universes that kind of emerge, keep emerging, right? It might be that there's an infinite past to that. It might be that there's there's a multiverse with an infinite past. If there's a multiverse with an infinite past, then uh, it's not going to be true that universe now means the multiverse. It's not true that it began to exist, right? So that will be so. But let's put that case aside and suppose that we've got actually there is um, a beginning. So there's an initial state of the universe. Question will come up now about what the metaphysical status of that initial state is. Is it contingent or is it necessary? Right. Now, it seems to me that if you're a naturalist and you're thinking about what the initial state of the universe is, the best option to go for is to suppose that it's necessary. Right. So every possible world starts off that way, the way that our world did. And then as there's causal evolution, there's indeterminism. And so you get other possible worlds branching out from, right. But all the possible worlds share some history with the actual world. So the initial state, given that there is one, the initial state of um, the world is necessary. Now, um, does it have a cause? No. Does it need one? No, because it had to exist, right? It couldn't yeah. have a cause, right? So the reply to Craig now is going to be that even if we suppose that that's the beginning, right, it doesn't need a cause. Yeah. yeah. So generally, yeah. these would say that's absurd. <laughs> well, <laughs> well may, maybe so. But of course, lots of naturalists, including the many of the new atheists are happy to say that theism is absurd too, right? But the, but, the, but the point, the kind of important point here is that uh, the theist wants to say that God is the initial thing and God exists of necessity. Mm. So compare that with the view that says that the initial thing is the initial state of the universe and it exists of necessity. That looks like a better view. Right, yeah. because it commits you to less, and it explains everything gets explained in exactly the same way. Yeah, right? and what? Why yeah. is there something at the beginning? Because there had to be, right? Yeah. So, so rather than, I mean, I'm not interested in that. It's absurd response. I'm interested in saying, look, here's two theories. Which one's better? And mm. on this point, the naturalist theory is winning because it's committing you to less, and there's nothing 
that's going unexplained on the naturalist theory that doesn't go on, you know. Yeah. 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 So you, you are leaving out the you are leaving out the something coming from nothing part, right? You're saying like no, something can well, cannot come. Well, from no theist worries about the fact that God comes from nothing, right? They just say mm -hmm. no, God exists of necessity. So yeah. I mean, if you can make that move, the naturalist can make it too. The natural state exists of necessity. It doesn't come from nothing. Right? Yeah. In any objectionable sense, it's no more objectionable in that case than it was in the case of God. Right. You didn't yeah. make any explanatory progress by saying, no, you can't say that the initial state of the universe is necessary. But yes, I can say that God's necessary. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There's, there's no advantage yeah. there. Uh, yeah, then yeah, they would it, say, hey, the Big Bang cosmology is saying, you know, it has a beginning and you are not, you're denying science. <laughs> uh, that's well, kind but of the, uh, one I guess I've... But I'm not doing that, right? I'm accepting. <laughs> I'm accepting all of the science, pretending that that's what the science says, right? That there's there's an initial state of the universe, right? If the science doesn't say that, then right, that's yeah. a different conversation. But if the science says that there's a beginning state, it's consistent with all of the science to say that that initial state is necessary, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't think the science says that the universe comes from nothing. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, um, no, the, the, it it doesn't say that. It, yeah. What it purports to do is to tell you what there is, and if mm -hmm. I mean at the moment the science doesn't say anything about the initial state, right? You get back yeah. to pre pre inflation, we don't have a good theory, right? So that's that's another difficulty, but we. For the purposes of having this conversation, we're pretending that the science tells us that there's an initial state, and now we can have we can have a serious argument, right? Yeah. So um, I think your charge is on the second premise of the Kalam argument that the universe, you know, began to exist. So I mean, well, well, it depends, right? The yeah. If if, if there's a a multiverse then the charge is going to be against the second premise. But if the idea is that there's an initial state that exists of necessity, it's going to be that whatever begins to exist has a cause, right? Because I'm accepting that it began to exist, but it doesn't have a cause, right? That's the beginning, right? It's the, yeah. That's where the universe began. But it's necessary that it began there, and so it doesn't need a cause, just as for the theist, God exists of necessity and so doesn't need a cause, can't, in fact, can't have one. So I, I have a question regarding that. Um, so you have the initial state of the universe and that is necessary, right? It doesn't come into being. So in a way, the universe doesn't really begin to exist, right? So, well, to, what I've said in various places is you better be careful to explain what you mean by begins to exist. Uh -huh. if if this is t, t equals zero, right, mm -hmm. there's no earlier times, and something exists there, then there's a certain sense in which it begins to exist. There's no earlier time at which it exists and it exists at this time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If that's what that you mean by begins to exist, then there's no problem in saying, okay, then this thing begins to exist, but it does so of necessity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was I was thinking about like coming into existence. You know, it wasn't there and then it came into existence. That in, in that right, but that I guess you can you can sort of say that too though, right? T equals zero, right? Uh -huh. There isn't it's not that there was something earlier. This is the first moment of time. There's nothing, right? There's nothing earlier. Uh -huh. Right. Um and Maybe you want to say it came into existence, but came into existence um, doesn't have the implications that you might have thought it would have had if it was some time other than t equals zero, right? Because I agree that things like at any later time, um, the things that exist exist because of what existed earlier, right? There's uh -huh. an evolution of state of the universe. Yeah. But initial state, or more broadly, the initial thing, has to have a different status. So I'm really, the way that I like to think about this is stop talking about natural reality, just talk about causal reality. And now let's think about the initial state of causal reality, supposing that there is one. What's its status? You've got two choices. You can say it's brutally contingent or you can say it's brutally necessary. Those are the choices. And we haven't yet decided whether we're going to be naturalists or theists, but we can, right? 
and yeah. and when yeah yeah um what do you think about the contingency arguments so in the version where we're saying that um there's a kind of maximal contingent fact and it's got to have an explanation so there's got to be a necessary fact that explains so i guess there are two things i want to say about that one is there's sort of van inwagen's worry what's the connection between the necessary thing and the contingent thing if it's necessary then surely the connected thing is necessary but if it's contingent then that wasn't the sum of contingency after all because there was this connection to the necessary thing yeah. that left out right so i think that's a genuine worry but i mean i also think that there's no problem with a naturalist view that supposes that the initial state is necessary and then that the evolution of state is indeterministic so you're going to get contingency at all later stages right um but that's not thinking now about facts but rather thinking about things the kind of evolution of state of the the universe seems to me to um mean that if you're a naturalist you can give this contingency argument right there's where does all this contingency come from well actually it comes from the necessary initial state and the opera and the kind of necessary opera the necessary operation of the indeterministic laws that's where it comes from right. yeah so um as far as i understand um your favorite view of modality and your favorite view of of the um reality is pretty much um you have a uh, history that all possible worlds share right so you have the actual world shares a history with all possible worlds and then you know um so basically there is a necessary part of um uh, all possible worlds and then they diverge from them you know based on objectively chancy uh, events so there doesn't have to be a necessary part so suppose that the past is infinite what will be true is that pick any other possible world and it'll share some initial infinite history with our world but there'll be no bit of it that all the worlds share right this is kind of one of those weird properties of infinity mm-hmm. things because um for any bit there'll be earlier divergences right and so they won't be necessary but you're right if there's an initial state then the initial state's necessary and it gets shared by all the worlds Uh, um if if it's an infinite past all that's true is that every world shares some history with the actual world yeah so i mean i think a point to be noted there is um you know um possibilities are not based on conceivability you know it's it's based on how the laws play out the natural laws play out it's based on like indeterministic events right yeah so it's quite common in contemporary philosophy for people to talk about um metaphysical possibility in terms of what's conceivable uh and that seems kind of weird to me because you're connecting something that's metaphysical to something that's epistemic or well, feels like it's epistemic it has to do yeah. with our cognitive powers uh and so um one of the things that i think recommends the alternative approach to metaphysical possibility is that it's obviously metaphysical right um but another thing to recommend it is that it doesn't give you lots and lots of possibilities it gives you just the possibilities that you need right mm-hmm. if you've got indeterminism it's it, it, sorry it could have been that a or b or c well then you need a b and c as possibilities I don't see any reason to think that there are more possibilities beyond those of a metaphysical kind. Of course, we talk about epistemic possibilities or doxastic possibilities where we're not thinking about anything metaphysical. So the dice is spinning. It's going to come mm-hmm. down 1 2 3 4 5 or 6. Those are all possibilities. Even if it's deterministic those are possibilities but only in an epistemic sense it's just measuring our ignorance we don't know enough about the initial conditions and the laws yeah. to work out which way it's going to go and so i don't want to i mean yes you can hear it's clearly conceivable that it comes down 1 2 3 4 5 or 6 but all that's giving you 
is something about our ignorance, nothing about metaphysics, right? So that's why yeah. that's why I want to go with the conception of metaphysical um, possibility, right? My yeah. that I'm offering. So um, just wanted to give the audience a picture of what Oppie is getting at. Um, basically, um, you know, contingency. You know, the only contingent things are the, you know, are the, the really in the, uh, the objectively chancy events in in the universe, right? So, uh, you know, would you say that quantum events are the kind of things that are that could be contingent? So I think that anything that's downstream from quantum events can also be contingent So, um, and can also be chancy. So suppose that there really are quantum chances. Suppose, for mm -hmm. example, that radioactive decay is indeterministic. Uh -huh. And suppose yeah. I've got a Geiger counter and I've, I've done suitable calibration to the background rate of decay. I can now use my Geiger counter to make decisions and nobody can know ahead of time what I'm going to do because effectively I've got a kind of quantum dice that I just keep rolling, right? Yeah. So, um, so long as I stick to my plan, right? The dice, I say, well, if it if my quantum dice comes up one, I'll do this, two, I'll do that, three, I'll do that, four, I'll do that. At the start of the minute, at the end of the minute, I'm going to roll the dice, predict what I'm going to do, the dice roll, it comes up four, I do four, nobody given that it was indeterministic, nobody could tell what I was going to do ahead of time. So it's mm. not just a micro thing. It can it can be funneled up to the macro level. And mm. that means that um, most probably everything that we do is contingent, right? Uh -huh. Because so, somewhere in the history, there's some yeah. indeterminate and that makes indeterministic sense. events that preceded it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so the uh, statements like it's possible that you know, an iron bar is floating in water. You know, I think I think at least we can conceive that it's possible. So it needs an explanation. Those kind of things are out of the picture. We are only speaking about, you know, things if, that yeah, things if that physics result says. From if physics says it's absolutely impossible for an iron bar to float in water, then it's just impossible. Right, and I, by impossible, I mean here that the laws and the initial conditions just rule it out. Uh -huh. I think this is I think this is a good, po uh, good point to, you know, discuss about your favorite version of PSR because it's something that people, it's, it's so controversial that some people accept PSR, some say, no, we don't need PSR, or we need partial explanations, not sufficient explanations. So how do you see this PSR? And... So I guess I think that everything, everything about natural reality has an explanation. The initial state's necessary. So why is it the way it is? Because it had to be, and that's an explanation. There's a bunch of stuff where there's indeterministic causation. And then the only thing that you can say, but it is a partial explanation is, from here, we could have got A, B, or C, we got A, right? So all the explanation of A is that it was one of the things we could have got from the prior state. And everything else is just deterministic, given that we've got this and this. We had to get this unless something else intervened, but nothing else did. Right? Yeah. So, so PSR means everything gets... So the kind of version of PSR I like Nothing has no explanation. Everything has some explanation, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. the initial state and, and the laws are necessary. Indeterministic things have some explanation, and the rest of it's deterministic. And so, of course, yeah. it has an explanation. Yeah. yeah. So, coming to that, like when when that kind of PSR is subscribed, you you have a question like, in theism, we have an initial state of God making a decision. And then yeah. in naturalism, you have a causal reality where the initial state changes to the next state. Yeah. So in one, you have an agent cost event, the other is an entity cost event. And, you know, an entity cost event is, you know, costly compared to agent cost or it's self-explanatory. Uh, how do you respond to such claims? So I don't see how agent causation could be cheaper than event causation. I really don't understand that. I, I guess um, it seems to me we just have 
Like if, if so, so on what's an example? Um, if a branch falls from a tree in the backyard, right, and we have an explanation of why the, the branch is lying there. Or alternatively, um, I've been working in another corner of the yard and I've cut a branch off a tree and I drag it across and I put it there. Right? It feels like there's no, there's no simplicity in going the agent cause versus the event cause. Um, there's no, it's not a better explanation that I dragged it there versus there was rot in the tree branch that caused the branch to fall. So I'm not, I, I'm not getting any sense about why it would somehow be more costly. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the, the basic idea is um, agent causation um, has a partial explanation for you know God's choices, right? So, I, I think the version I'm talking about is the one defended by Alexander Pruss and those uh, people, right? That their idea is, you know, you, you know, you have God, and God is an agent, a libertarian free agent, and He makes free choices, right? So, what's the explanation of God's choices? It's just God made that choice. It's self-explanatory. Right, but that doesn't. But, but that's only a partial explanation. It doesn't explain yeah. why God made this choice rather than that one, which he could have made, right? Yeah. So it's a it's not as good as an explanation that says I, I think it's not as it's not as good an explanation as this had to follow from that. Yeah. So I mean, um, I I think the basic, you know, um conjunction I, I think the, the point they're trying to make is for, for the naturalists they don't have a partial explanation you know so that they have to commit to some brute things but then we can appeal to partial explanations and that's somehow that's so that's it. right but they're committing to their partial explanation means they have a partial explanation and the rest of it is brute right yeah. why did b follow from c rather than a I got no answer. That's what Proust says. He's got no answer. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. He just what he what he does is denies that things like that require explanations. But of course, we can ask him. So why did why did God do that rather than this? And he'll just say, and and when he just says no explanation, you think, well, so much the worse for the for whatever principle of sufficient reason he's committed to. Yeah. Yeah. Just thinking about you know uh, the evolutionary argument against naturalism and your particular response uh, to it. I mean, you had released a 2021 paper on that. You re recently released a paper on you know those kind of arguments from reason, right? So, right. Yeah. I, the, but I didn't. I didn't set out in full what I think about the evolutionary argument there because it's in the book on religion and naturalism and religion. Um, okay, so planting of things that the probability that our cognitive faculties are reliable, conditional on the truth of both naturalism and evolution, is very small. That's kind of the cornerstone of his evolutionary argument against naturalism, the claim that that probability is low. Now, um, and as a special case, he argues that um, the probability that we're reliable with respect to metaphysics, conditional on naturalism and evolution, is low. Right? Mm -hmm. And he thinks that that's um, that with with a little bit of work, these show that um, that naturalism is self-defeating right? because you have to think that you're reliable and you have to think that you're reliable with respect to metaphysics i assume uh, i think that um with respect to metaphysics it's obvious that we're not reliable so what reliability means is that we hit truth most of the time but the disagreement amongst us on metaphysical questions shows that we don't hit truth most of the time. All of us are wrong most of the time in our metaphysical judgments, no matter what those judgments are. So um, 
so that part of his argument can't be convincing, right? If it if it was an objection to naturalism, it'd equally be an objection to theism and any other sensible position. Yeah. So, so I mean, so we know we're not reliable there, um, regardless, right? <laughs> Yeah. So, on the other hand, if we're focusing on our faculties generally, right, uh, the probability that we're reliable, conditional on naturalism and evolution for in our visual perception, say, is actually very high. It's not low at all. Mm -hmm. right? And so his premise is just wrong in that case. Yeah. yeah do, do, you think, do you think this the issue with Ian is that um you are you know disregarding the evolutionary science describing how how you know organs and capabilities can track track truths and just doing you know assigning 50 50 probability that hey this could have gone that way or this way so you could be wrong so exactly what we're planting is going wrong is quite complicated in the book naturalism and religion, I say that I'm not really sure that I can say exactly where he goes wrong. I think it's kind of subtle. But I agree with what you just said, right? The thing is that if you look at contemporary evolutionary accounts of our evolution from maybe it's four and a half billion years ago now up to the present, there's nowhere where there's a kind of step that you think, oh, how could that have happened? That gets you all the way to our hominid ancestors with the capacities that we've got 50 to 70 or 90,000 years mm. ago, or if you think earlier hominids a million years ago or whatever, mm. right? So, so that might be right, but that, that, he, that there's a kind of lack of appreciation of the current state of evolutionary theorizing. But it's also the case that planting, it talks about a bunch of examples um, in a way that I think misrepresents the way that naturalists think about the cognitive capacities of, for example, zebras or um, frogs or whatever, that he has a kind of naive behaviorist view about their capacities when in fact there's complicated representation going on in zebras and frogs uh, so, yeah so th so there's another story to tell there about how it seems to this is related to the kind of 50 50 thing that you were talking about right um there there, there is something else going on which is not about evolutionary theory but it's about the capacities of animals that I think he's getting wrong as well. Yeah. So, um, um, so, so basically, um, uh, even if we are not able to kind of pinpoint where exactly, you know, the argument might might have gone wrong, even if technically we're not able to do that, um, I mean, you you have made a reductio argument against it. So basically, they they'll have to drop their reasoning, or they'll have to accept that theism is also self defeating right that's the dilemma uh, that they right in. that's right so so um in in the chapter there's a fairly short argument that gets you to the conclusion that the argument's no good and then there's a much longer speculative bit trying to figure out where exactly the argument goes where sorry where planting his case goes wrong mm -hmm. so yeah i mean i'll accept what you just said that sounds yeah. about right 